Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. Speak to us this morning, as you already have, through music and prayer and testimony and scripture reading. Help us to hear from you. Any worries or anxieties that we have, Lord, help us to cast aside. May we lay them at your feet, and may we know, Lord, that you desire to take them from us. And Lord, I also ask for your help for, for me today, and that you're able to use this imperfect person to speak the truth of your perfect love. Help all of us to hear from you today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we are going to get ready to... Oh, before I do that, I skipped something before I get to the poll. I was so, so, so excited about today's sermon. I skipped a few things I needed to share. I uh, want to let you know about the week, this week's events. Um, at the 21st, as we have our service uh, of remembrance is what it's called. And just want to invite you guys to come to that. You've already heard about that, but just want to remind you again. And then Christmas Eve is coming up. On what day? The 24th, that's right. Uh, and, uh, and we are going to have several services, 11 o'clock traditional service, uh, a 3 o'clock family service is more geared toward our children, and then we'll have a 5 and a 7 that are both contemporary or our modern services, and then we'll have a 9 o'clock service that will be uh, traditional as well. And so you're invited to come as many of these as you want. Uh, try to think about people that you would like to invite. And uh, we hope and we believe they'll be blessed that they're able to come. Uh, we also, the 11 o'clock traditional and the 5 o'clock modern will be uh, live streamed as well. And you can watch those in demand a little bit later if you need to. Then the 25th, um, we're inviting everybody to worship at home. We will have a video on our website and we'll also e be emailing it out uh, Christmas morning. Uh, it'll be a special message. And I'm very excited. Uh, my dad, who's a Methodist pastor, he is giving the message on Christmas Day. And so that'll be cool. And then the following Sunday is January the 1st. And, um, you know, and because we all like to party like Methodists, uh, <laughs> we are not having service on the 1st as well. We're going to give our volunteers and our staff uh, that day off as well. And you'll also be worshiping at home that day. And the video will go live at 930. And so um, if you have any questions about that or anything you want to speak with me about, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. The last thing I want to say is that uh, for our Christmas Eve, we have a whole bunch of volunteers, but we still need a few more. And so uh, Mary Catherine will be, as you, if you're here in person, as you go out these doors, there'll be a table right uh, to your right. Uh, and uh, we still need some. We particularly need some parking attendants. Uh, and so um, you'd be, you get to hold those things they do at airports, you know, and so pretty cool. You got a lot of power. You can tell people to stop where to go, right? Uh, and so we want to invite you to take advantage of that and uh, help us out. Uh, it really would be great if you could do that. It takes uh, a lot of people to make services happen. Um, and, so, and so with that, I'm going to pray one more time just to get myself back in my space. So let's, let's pray again. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you again for this day, and I thank you so much for my friend Steve's testimony. And Lord, I pray now for my words, and that they would ring true um, with what you desire for each of us, and that's to love you and to love others. It's your name we pray. Amen. So um, this is something I should never say in church, right? But make sure you have your cell phones out if you have it with you. Uh, we're going to do a quiz. Uh, if you don't have your phones with you today, we still invite you to participate. Uh, make a mental note what your vote would be. And so the first question is, um, what day is today Sunday? Uh, yes or no? And uh, I don't think we even had any smart Alex, did we? Uh, so yeah, so uh, that's a good sign. So yes, today is Sunday. So here is the first question, uh, or the second question, I guess. In, in the first verse of the song, Deck the Halls, just one verse all the way through, how many la-la-las are there? And uh, we'll give you a few seconds. Uh, is it 8, 16, 32, or 64? All right, we'll close out voting here in another few seconds. The correct answer is 32. Yes. So y'all can go practice that after church today uh, if you want. Yes. Uh, correct answer is 32. All right. Here is the next question. Uh, what occupation did Hermie 
from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer want to leave the North Pole for? Uh, pastor, Lord of the Rings actor, teacher, or dentist? Lord of the Rings actor, got some love, that's good. As you can see, obviously the question is dentist, yep, yeah. Hermie wanted to be a dentist. Uh, all right, very important question, this one. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Yes or no? Thank you, whoever said that. Yes. Oh, come on. Adam, if it gets any closer, change it, all right? Yes, according to Pastor Gordon, Die Hard is, um, is a Christmas movie. All right. Now to the more um, biblical questions based a little bit on our scripture readings today, although they weren't necessarily given the answer. How many wise men, how many magi were there? Two, three, four, or we have no idea, or we don't know. How many magi wise men were there? All right, the question to this might surprise you, but it is D. We, have, we don't know. Uh, we assume that there are three uh, because of the song, uh, or the, the song where it says, or no, we assume it because of the three gifts that were given to Jesus. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And you wouldn't show up at a party, right, without a gift. Uh, and so they concluded there's three. But the truth is um, they believe there was perhaps way more than that. And I'm going to talk more about that in a few moments. So um, it, it's probably definitely not three. It was probably closer to 20, uh, up to 100 perhaps. And I'll talk about that in a minute. All right. When did the wise men visit Jesus? The day he was born, two days after he was born, two months after he was born, two years after he was born. All right, I'm very impressed. It is, it, we, most scholars believe it was about two uh, years um, after Jesus was born. And so if you want to have a theologically correct uh, um, uh, nativity, you need to put the wise men in another room, okay? <laughs> and so children, I'm giving you permission to move the wise men to some strange place today, okay? Uh, and so uh, feel free to do that. Um, yeah, it, 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 most of us assume it was the day of, uh, but most scholars uh, believe uh, for different reasons that it was probably closer to two years. And the main reason uh, is that when Herod gave a decree to kill children under two years old, it's believed that he started with the year two because that's when they believed that that's when Jesus would have been born. So it would have been two years uh, most likely is what's believed. All right, last one. What animals did the magi, the wise men, ride in on? Horses, giraffes, camels, donkeys. Most are 97 or 101, more than that, are wrong. Um, it is not believed that it was camels. It was most likely horses. So you need to replace your camels with horses. Should be no problem, right? Yeah. This is a common misconception. Uh, mis, uh, uh, Whenever you see movies from this time period, the actors are riding on camels. However, most people in northern Arabia typically rode on Arabian horses. At the time of Christ's birth, camels were used as pack animals, but wealthy travelers used a more comfortable and swift horse horses. All right. Everybody give yourself a round of applause on the quiz. There you go. So up here, you, you kind of see uh, the, the characters that are often in the nativity. You got the wise men, Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and you got the shepherds over here. Uh, the wise men, as I said, um, it's believed, we, we believe they came from Arabia. Uh, and, um, and so um, uh, and they most likely did not come in a group of three like our wise men did here. Um, but what would most likely have happened is when they traveled, they would have traveled in a larger caravan that would have been as few as 20 people and maybe as many as 100 people. And so just imagine that these 100 people showing up to see King Herod uh, in Jerusalem. It just kind of gives you a different feel about how maybe things would have went. And uh, they were wealthy, uh, and they were from the West, and uh, they had these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so what is interesting to think about is that these wise men 
were not Jewish. Um, these wise men perhaps did not even worship, worship uh, the God of Israel. But yet they saw the star and they were invited. God instructed them to go see Jesus. And so these people that God called to go see Jesus were not even, they were not the people that you would expect. Uh, they were people from another continent that looked vastly different probably than the people they went to go see. Last week we talked about Mary, and you can see Mary here holding Jesus, at least in this picture, or this uh, statue, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, as I talked last week, Mary, uh, you may or may not know this, um, she was a poor peasant girl. Probably a teenager, somewhere between 13 to, to 16 years old. Uh, and um, she um, was a nobody in a nowhere place. Uh, uh, where she was from, she was not well thought of. She was not noble. Uh, she was not a princess. She didn't have the royal line going through her blood or anything like that. And yet, who did God choose to carry God's child? God chose Mary. Just cool to to think about the kind of people that God chooses and that God uses. Then you have Joseph. Joseph, we don't know too much about him. Uh, it does say that he was a righteous man, but just like uh, uh, they, were a poor, they were poor people that married each other. Uh, it says that after they, they gave birth and they, they presented Jesus at the temple, the sacrifice they gave was of a dove. Uh, now, if you had money, if you're wealthier, your sacrifice could have been a lamb. Uh, but they gave, according to Leviticus, what, what poor people gave. They gave a dove. And so again, uh, Jesus was not born into, uh, even though Joseph had the, the David line in him, uh, they were not well-known, rich people. Not the, not the type of people that you think that God would choose to care for his son. Then over here, uh, you got the shepherds. Uh, and the shepherds we always think about as being warm and cuddly. And those are the, you know, you think about children in bathrobes, right? Uh, with the towel over their head. Uh, and uh, they're cute. But the truth is, um, uh, shepherds were an entry-level position job. And it was a job you really didn't want. And children didn't dream about one day being a shepherd. It was the last thing that they wanted to be. And, uh, and, you know, what's cool is, is that even though these, these were shepherds and, and they were, by most people, they were probably dismissed or ignored, they were the people that God spoke to and had to go see Jesus the day that he was born. There's this guy I follow uh, on Instagram that I like a lot. His name um, is um, Dave Adamson. Uh, he goes by Aussie Dave. And this was a post that he had this week, and he takes pictures and then makes uh, observations about uh, the pictures. And uh, the, you can, that's the cover photo. And then on the, the, one of the pages, it said, After Jesus was born, God sent angels to declare the birth of the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior of the world, to a group of nearby shepherds, right? Typically, we picture these shepherds as being mid-45-year-old men with beards. But history, culture, and suggest these shepherds were actually young girls. That's right, girls. See, in the, mid, the Mideast, the Middle East, most shepherding is done by young children, most of them girls. Typically, the men watch from a distance as their young relatives, as their young relatives take care of the sheep. From all my trips to the Holy Land, I've only seen young kids tend to their family sheep. And since shepherding was considered a lowly role, it was usually performed by girls as young as eight who would look after the flock until they were ready to be married. There were exceptions, of course. David was a shepherd, but remember, he also was the youngest member of his family. So I like to think that God chose to reveal the birth of Jesus to a group of young ladies first. Isn't that cool to think about? And so now that I've destroyed your whole nativity, <laughs> you got to get some white out over the beard, right? Um, I just want you to think about your nativity, and I want you to think about the diversity, and maybe even the inclusiveness of it. You got the poor peasant girl, you got Joseph, a poor man, you got these non-Jewish magi that came from a long way away, 
And then you got these night shift shepherds that very well might have been young boys or young girls. And these were the first people to hear the good news of the birth of Jesus. And the reason I bring this up is, as we continue our series, Good News, today I want to talk about good news for all people. And I believe our nativity is a reminder to each and every one of us that the birth of Jesus is good news for all people. Luke 2.10, our verse we've been looking at, says this, Do not be afraid, for I am bringing you good news that will be great joy for all people. It doesn't say some people, a few people, most people, right? What's it say? All people. And so all means all. It doesn't mean the people that think like us, that believe like us, that vote like us, that want what we want. What it means is that it's a little bigger than that, amen? It's the people that think differently than us. It's the people that perhaps believe differently than us. It's the, you know, and, and so sometimes what we want to do is we want to try to make circles smaller. And what the nativity teaches us is that the circle is bigger than we like to think. The good news of Jesus is for all people. And this is the message of the first Christmas. It's even the words that the, that the angels said to the shepherds. And it seems that ever since the church, ever since the first Christmas, the church has been trying to make that circle smaller rather than big like it was supposed to be. And I believe that in the Christmas story and throughout the Bible, we are taught that the good news is for all people. And yet it often gets distorted and forgotten by the church. The Christmas story goes over the top to show that the good news of Jesus is for all people. And it's not just the church that does this sometimes. The habit of the people of God drawing boundaries and needing to be really clear about who is in and who is out uh, has, and who has access to the promises of God has been going on forever, right? We want to make our circle smaller rather than bigger. We want the people to be in that are the people that we think are in, right? We know who's in and we know who's out. The people of Israel... And Jesus' time tripped over this. They saw the promises of Jesus. They saw the promises of God for them. And not necessarily for anybody else. There were people in Jesus' time that struggled with this whole insider-outsider idea. And, the people are, and, the, and there are people that struggle with this today as well. And people in the church sometimes see themselves as the people of God. But sees people that are outside the church as not of God. And I believe from the very beginning, God was clear. God chose a certain people to be a blessing. But they weren't to be a blessing solely for themselves, were they? They were called to be a blessing to all people. In the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, God calls Abram, uh, who eventually becomes Abraham. And he says, I'll make you a father of many nations. And you have as many descendants as there are stars in the skies. And then he says this, you will be blessed to be a blessing. In other words, you've been blessed not for yourself, but you're being blessed to be a blessing to other people. And then in the, the book of Exodus, um, you know, God chooses a people so that they could influence and bless other people through that influence. God speaks to the prophet Isaiah, and God says to the prophet Isaiah this, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Now, that word Gentiles is not a word we use or hear very often, but Gentiles means pretty much non-Jewish. So for all. The promises of God were meant for everyone, even if at first God was going to work through a specific group of people. And so when the angels announced that Jesus is, is good news for all people, we should not be surprised because that's the message that carries on throughout 
the Scriptures. But sometimes we forget. The life of Jesus models this. Think about the type of people that Jesus called. Jesus called common, ordinary fishermen. Jesus called tax collectors that were enemies of the state. Jesus had women that were followers of his. And again, women were seen as as second-class citizens. And yet, they follow Jesus. They are in many ways his disciples. Um, uh, Jesus speaks, uh, and not only speaks, has tax collectors be one of uh, his disciples. Jesus heals the sick, the spiritually sick, uh, the physically sick, and the mentally sick. And when the angels say good news, a great joy for all people. The angel means it, and then Jesus, as he grows up, he goes and he lives that out. It was modeled in the nativity, and it's something he spent the rest of his life participating in. When the angel says good news, a great joy for all people, the angel means it. And I really think it's so important for us to grasp this idea, and not only to grasp this idea that God is for all people, but for us to also live that out. Because it's very important. Let me show, give you a few examples and ways how it is important. A few weeks ago, I had a mother come into my office, and we sat down, and she was telling me that her and her daughter were driving around after school, going to some appointment or something like that. And the daughter said to her mom, I'm starting to have same-sex attraction. And this was something that the daughter didn't necessarily want. This wasn't, wasn't what she dreamed of or what she wanted. But that's where she was, and those were the feelings she was feeling. And she confessed this to her mom And then, after they talked for a few moments, she had two questions for her mom. Are you going to kick me out of the home? And does God hate me? Think about those two questions. Are you going to kick me out of my home? And does God hate me? And the mom, who was not prepared to have this conversation, um, said, well, no, we're not kicking you out of the home. And yes, God loves you. And then uh, they went on to talk, and uh, the the whole reason this whole thing came up is because of the shooting that took place um, in uh, Colorado Springs, um, where a a gentleman walked into a a Colorado Springs gay bar and killed five people. The next day, the the, the shooter's father, uh, his video of the father kind of went viral. You maybe heard about it, maybe you hadn't. And they interviewed the father, and this is what the father said. And then I go find out, it's a gay bar. I said, God, is he gay? I got scared. Is he gay? And he's not gay. So I said, phew. And so what he was saying is, he was not okay with his son potentially being gay, but he was okay with his son being a murderer. Now, how warped and sick is that? And so when we get the message that God hates gay people, and it's often come from Christian mouths, we can understand where this daughter came from, can't we? And that's why we need to be crystal clear That Jesus is good news for all people. Not just some people. Not just a few people. Not most people. But all people. We have to be clear about that. We have to be clear in our actions and words that Jesus is good news for all. Because children can grow up thinking they are not good enough. Thinking they they they, they don't believe the right things. They don't have the right emotions. And we want our children to know that they are loved, that they are beloved children of the Most High God. As part of our mission focus, our serve missions are to vulnerable children and food insecurities. 
If you were here last week, you saw all these bags we had in the, in the hallway. I believe we almost had 400 bags. I think we had 390-something. And we took those bags to, to, to Belmont um, uh, to help them, uh, to give the people that were struggling to, to provide food, to have food on their tables. We took them so they could have a holiday meal. And we do that because we want them to know that they are cared about and they are loved. And the good news for Jesus is for all people, not just some people. Jesus calls us to share the good news to the poor, to those that are struggling financially. And so when we do that, that's a way of us living out good news for all. Then we have vulnerable children. The last few months... We've had a, or a group from Chesterfield County meeting in our building. They are the Early Childhood Special Education Team from Chesterfield County, the ECSE. Uh, and uh, these are, um, prov they provide services to children with disabilities who need special attention. All we're doing is letting them use our space for free. Because we want them to know that they are cared about and they are loved. And that God cares about them and that God loves them. And even though the only thing we're really doing right now is offering them space, hopefully this is the beginning of something that we could connect with. Because the parents need to know that they are cared about, that God cares about them and loves about them, and these children need to know that they are cared about and they are loved. Also, a few months ago, we started a new ministry here, um, I'll explain what it is. First, it's called the Recovery Academy. It meets at the Tech Center, the old Clover Hill High School. And the Recovery Academy is a year-round program serving high school students from Central Virginia who are recovering from drug addiction. It's the first one in the state. And, uh, and so right now, they just have a few uh, students. Uh, and uh, Susan Custer, a member of our church, uh, she works uh, for Chesterfield County Public Schools. She found out about this. And even though we're just in a very basic level beginning to help out, we're providing them with food and snacks. Apparently, they really like the microwavable macaroni and cheese. So do I, amen. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, and, and we're providing them letters of support. And one of the cool things that happened in November was is that uh, Woodlake created a panel um, that consisted of um, a couple of police officers from our community, including Officer Dietrich, who's often here at our church, uh, and then uh, we had a member um, who uh, is uh, in, he's, uh, he's had years of sobriety. And then we also had a mother who had lost a child um, to drugs. And so these three people were speaking uh, to the children, just like a panel discussion, question and answer and all that stuff. And, and then um, eventually, as this was going on, um, they, the children, the, the youth started to speak to them as well. And then somebody was reporting to me and telling me that uh, by the end, there was not a dry eye in that room. And the reason we want to support them and the reason we want to try to help them is because Jesus is good news for all people. Amen. Including the addict. The vulnerable children. People with food insecurities. And if we don't give them that message, who's going to give them that message? Amen. God. We are God's mouthpiece. And we need to let this world know that they are beloved children of the Most High God and that we want to bless them. I've got a couple next steps for you. Here's the first one. Who needs to hear that Jesus is good news for all people? Is there somebody in your life that's just having a hard time, maybe thinks they're not lovable, maybe it's just struggling, and they need to hear that Jesus was born in part just for them. If there's somebody that's just struggling, and they need to hear that they are loved, and that Jesus came in part just for them, and that they are beloved... And then the second next step is simply this. Tell them. Tell them this. 
Jesus has come to set the captives free, and he's not talking about necessarily just prisoners. He's talking about those that are in bondage to addiction, to sin. The angel comes and says, I bring you good news that will be of great joy for all people. When I was growing up, I um, collect, I had a lot of Star Wars action figures and a lot of G.I. Joe action figures. Say amen if you can. Anybody else here with me? Yeah. Um, Well, and one of the things I used to do as a little boy is I would put them around the nativity. Um, And so um, I don't know when I started or when I stopped, but uh, I haven't done it in a while. and, you know, back then we didn't have cell phones to take pictures, so there's no pictures of this. And so um, I still have my Star Wars figures, my G.I. Joe figures. I'm not sure where they are. I went through a spell where I blew them up with those little M80s, if you remember them. <laughs> but uh, I don't know where they are. Um, they probably got thrown away. Um, but so I had my daughters come yesterday, two of them, Wesley and Chloe. And uh, we have this manger, this nativity is usually out there. And I had them recreate what I did. And so go ahead and put that picture up, Adam. So Batman's on the top, which they were really proud of. I got a Chick-fil-A cow in there, too. I don't know if you can find them. Um, But what's interesting, I think, is this is a great, silly reminder that Jesus is for all people. For the G.I. Joes, for the Star Wars people, for the DC, for the Marvel For the black, for the white, the gay and the straight. Jesus is good news for all people. So children, I invite you to do this at your house. Amen. Move the wise men. Put all your action figures there. But remember what the angel said. I bring you good news that will be great joy to all people. That's the message of Christmas. It's good news of great joy for all people. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and I'll invite uh, Michael up um, and Kaisha. I believe they're going to sing a song for us here. And, um, and so uh, let's uh, pray, and then after I pray, it'll be open to us to our, for a prayer time where you can kneel, you can light a candle, you can fill out a prayer request card. Uh, You can also take a prayer square to to give to somebody to let them know that you're praying for them. And so uh, let's pray. Most gracious, loving Lord, you're indeed an awesome God. We thank you for your nativity and how unlikely it sometimes seemed that you have shepherds that were possibly young children, boys and girls, that you have Mary and Joseph who are not really significant people. You have wise men and magi who were not Jewish that came to recognize who Jesus was. May we remember that you came in part because you are good news, a great joy to all people. Help us to reflect on that. And may we think about who needs to hear that good news. And may we be willing to tell them. Amen.